Well, thank you very much for, for that, um, Ron. Um, my relationship with professors of law has never been, not always been such an easy one. Um, uh, the somewhat in, undistinguished degree I got at university was, I'm sure, absolutely nothing to do with the fact that two weeks before um, the results were determined, there was a cricket match in the faculty. And um, my cricket, for anyone who knows me, was more coarse than fine. And I was put on to bowl when the professor came in to bat. And I was desperately trying to make sure that he could score a few runs. And of course, as a result, I bowled him first ball. <laughs> but that was history. Um, but thank you very much for um, your hospitality here. I, in, in fact, it, I'm afraid he's not here, but um, it was actually Dale Bramley is responsible for me being in New Zealand and actually responsible for what became the start of a bit of a tour, really. But it all started here in, uh, in New Zealand, and I've received a lot of very good hospitality here. Um, it, it's just a shame you couldn't um, produce a slightly better weather today, but never mind. Um, let, let me just start with a, a, a thought which was quoted in my first report. Um, Florence Nightingale said, said this in 1863, that it may seem a strange principle as the very first requirement in a hospital that it should do the sick no harm. She, of course, was in effect repeating what Hippocrates had said really rather a long time previously. Um, but I found it pretty strange that uh, in 2010 I, I was having to repeat, and I quoted that principle in a report about a National Health Service hospital in the 21st uh, century. And what lay behind that really is that, wh why it's strange is that we just tend to take that a little bit for granted, that of course we're there to help the sick, we're not there to do them harm. And because we take it for granted too much, um, as we will see, uh, unfortunate things happen. Just a word about Stafford Hospital, um, that's it. Um, it, in English terms, is a relatively small district general hospital with a turnover of about 110, 120 million pounds a year, uh, 3,000 staff, it services the local community. And Dale again is not here, but he, he, he's cringed twice now when I talk about the geography of this, this, um, uh, this uh, hospital. Um, it didn't get off to a very good start. It was built in the 1980s. And um, in fact, mine is not the first public inquiry into the goings on there. In the 1980s, there, there was an outbreak of Legionnaires' disease there, which led to some fatalities at the hospital. <coughs> and there was a public inquiry to learn the lessons of uh, the con detection and control of and treatment of uh, Legionnaires' disease. But one of the interesting things in that report was that uh, uh, Sir John Badenock, the chairman, uh, lavished praise on the compassion and dedication of the care given uh, by the staff of the hospital. Um, th th I've got a pointer, there we go. The front door to the hospital is, is, is in there. Uh, that big building there, which actually looks enormous, and it is, is the, is, is the records office. And um, this was not a, and still isn't, a hospital where electronic records have been embraced. The result is there are there's something a bit like a pharaoh's tomb in there of files, all dog-eared, people almost going up and down ladders to find them. And I just don't know how long it would take to get someone's ancient records out to look at. So no doubt they're not. But um, you go along a corridor in the entrance here, and just to the right-hand side of the entrance is something which I'm glad to say I've not yet seen in a New Zealand hospital, which is a shop selling donuts. <laughs> and you go along the corridor here, which is, and it's calm, it's not dirty, it looks all right, and people wandering around. No, you don't see staff looking at you very much. And all, off the corridors are various wards, reasonably well signed. The one sign's quite difficult to find is anything to do with the, um, the, the, the NHS Trust office. But if you pers persevere, you go down a few <coughs> corridors, up several flights of stairs to that corner, and in that corner is the, is the office of the Trust. And right in the corner, on the second floor, with a nice view of the trees at the back, is the chief executive's office. It's about as far from the activity of the hospital as you could imagine. Not a problem, really, if the incumbent of that office um, gets out and about a lot. And I suspect, however, the chief executive we're going to talk about didn't perhaps do so enough. But the other interesting thing is, is the union representative's office, that's the nursing representatives and so on, 
uh, they were given an office in that caravan in the car park. That's where the staff representatives live next door to the uh, e equally sized caravan for the car park attendant. So that's just a, a slightly unfair tour of, of the <laughs> hospital. Um, now for those of you that don't know and, have, and, and actually go to sleep at night rather than worrying about the power systems work in other countries, there's just a quick slide about how the National Health Service sort of works. Um, Parliament obviously votes uh, funds of 110, I think, billion pounds to the Department of Health and the Minister there f uh, for the purpose of providing um, free access to all from care in the, um, in the UK. And uh, within England and Wales, and we, we are a divided country more than perhaps we care to admit, so different arrangements, there are different arrangements in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but in England and Wales, I'd say England because Wales does it differently as well now, that the, we have had strategic health authorities uh, in regions uh, which uh, divides the funds up amongst primary care trusts who actually commission the local services. Uh, and uh, the, the, so the strategic health authority and the primary care trust between them had a degree of oversight of the provision of care. There was a quality regulator called the Health Care Commission, uh, which has now been succeeded by the Care Quality Commission. Um, the primary care trust under the new reform have been changed into clinically led commissioning groups and the strategic health authorities have been uh, abolished. I, I do hope you're keeping up there at the back. Um, th there is a, a, a governance regulator called Monitor, which regulated and uh, could fire and fire, in effect, the directors of foundation trusts, who are a breed of trust to which uh, the government required all trusts to aspire, who were, uh, in effect, more autonomous. They could, uh, if they made a surplus, they could keep and reinvest the surplus, whereas an NHS trust would have to hand it back. Uh, and were more subject to central uh, government control. Now, all these bodies were under statute regard to have regard to quality, which included safety and effectiveness in uh, the delivery of care. But interestingly, at least the primary care trust didn't really regard, even though it was commissioning the services paying for them, uh, thought this was really the responsibility of other people. But then around this uh, sort of direct line of responsibility were a number of professional regulators, um, both in training and in uh, relation to doctors and nurses and so on. There were local scrutiny bodies, uh, councils, uh, patient involvement groups and so on. There were uh, guidance groups, there's NICE which you will have heard of, which um, undertakes clinically uh, evidence-based reviews really of uh, best practice. The Royal Colleges for the practitioners offer guidance and so on. The National Patient Safety Agency, rather peculiarly now abolished, uh, was the centre for reporting incidents and so on and, and putting out learning about them and, and alerts. The, the process still goes on, but it doesn't have its own separate agency. So that's in the very brief overall picture. And in relation to my second inquiry, um, I was trying to count them up this morning, actually. I, I think I had to look if only briefly in some cases, uh, what about 27 to 30 organisations did, um, all of whom theoretically had responsibility for some part of the uh, oversight, some part of the activity of a hospital in England. Uh, and you might think, well, maybe you wouldn't think it's surprising if you have that number of bodies that uh, really bad things can fall between the, cr the, the cracks between them. Now, another part of the context was what was going on in the system at the time. Well, I was looking at a period of what was going on roughly between 2005 and 2009, but I, I had to take into account what's happened um, since. But the, the disaster we're, I'm about to describe occurred really between those um, years. And um, the first thing was, and I've hinted at this already, there were multiple reorganisations going on in the system. Um, no Secretary of State for Health, no government, is able to leave the NHS alone because uh, it takes a huge part of the budget. It, along with education, is perhaps one of the most, is the most important thing the voters are, are, are worried about. So, constantly it is thought that it is a good idea to reorganise things, either to save money or to increase efficiency. Sometimes, but surprisingly rarely, because it would be thought to be a safer way 
of doing things. And some, quite more often than not, the reasons for the reorganisations are re never really articulated in, in a way that uh, the public can understand. But anyway, the oversight bodies I mentioned were suddenly reduced in number quite substantially. So lots of people were looking for jobs elsewhere at the same time as carrying on their day job. The Healthcare Commission, which was set up as a result of the Bristol Inquiry, and, and its first chair, was uh, only chair, was the chairman of that inquiry, um, suffered the fact that its abolition was announced 18 months after it was set up. But it then had to carry on in operation, I think, for about two years after that, no, under this sort of sentence of death. A and uh, it got its own back, really, because the, its very last act before going out of business was to publish its report into a uh, 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 Stafford Hospital, uh, which, of course, left its successor uh, with quite a job to do. In addition to that, there was the policy drive that all NHS trusts would become foundation trusts, and this meant significant governance changes in these organisations. They, they had to fit a template for how to, how to run things with the board, committee structures, and so on. A and a very rigorous process of inspection was gone through uh, 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 to ensure that the systems fitted the template for a foundation trust. Uh, a very rigorous inspection took place of business plans and whether the financial viability, uh, uh, or plans for fi financial vi viability stacked up. Remarkably little, as we will see, uh, of what they did had anything to do with the quality of service being provided by the, um, by the hospital. But the resources required internally to actually achieve this were very considerable indeed. And the pressure from the top to accelerate this process was also considerable because, needless to say, being a bureaucratic process, it got slower and slower. Then there were the financial issues. Um, they have this wonderful phrase in England, and I don't know if you have it here, called cost improvement plans. And um, that's really another word for saying you've got to make economies. Uh, and um, quite a lot of the time that doesn't work out as being something you do through productivity, but actually just making cuts and then hiding them in the undergrowth of the accounts, rather. Uh, and uh, in, in Mid Staffordshire's case, uh, they were being required year on year, over a number of years, to make cost improvements of something like 8%, which uh, was uh, very stressful indeed to them. And then finally, and this I think will be more familiar to you from what I gather here, uh, there was the pressure of government access, to, uh, government imposed access targets. Um, we used to have terrible experiences with our emergency <coughs> departments. Uh, all over the country, they would be under pressure with patients on trolleys, uh, not being seen sometimes, it seemed like, for, for days. A and um, so a, a, a target was set that everyone must be seen and, in fact, discharged from A&E within four hours of arrival. And it, the compliance rate was set at something like 98%. And uh, they, uh, trusts that didn't meet that um, uh, were in trouble. And if they didn't meet it for very long, that was basically potentially career-limiting stuff for the chief executive. So real pressure on that. A and uh, there were others, like the cancer, time, cancer waiting time for treatment and so on. And it's right to say that all these targets, and there were others, um, produced dramatic improvements in what happened in most, most emergency departments, and the waiting times really came down. Significantly, they're now going up again, and there are more d issues as um, A&E has become, a, I'm afraid, a popular place to go. But um, all those pressures, and there were others, w came down, we were bearing down on this particular trust, but like every other trust. So none of the, these things were particularly unusual, except perhaps two things. One, they, found they were rather behindhand in their w uh, moving towards foundation trust status, and uh, they had started the, in the, two, the 2000s in financial difficulty. So the pressure, financial pressure on them was, was greater. So that, behind all this then was a, a, an instability of people. Uh, and this again is common through, through the system. Uh, now, many of these people won't be very familiar to you, but it struck me that it, in the course of the period I was looking at, there were all those people on the top row, with the exception of Mr. Brown, um, who were uh, ministers of, our ministers of health, secretaries of state for health. They don't hang around very long. They, they stay in office a couple of years, 
often there's an election and the government changes, or even when there isn't, they, they change post frequently. And every Secretary of State for Health has a slightly different way of doing it. The current Secretary of State, this gentleman here, he's a keen cyclist, which is why he wears his helmet, not because of his popularity with the voters, um, it, it, I, I think probably has a slightly different view to how things should be run to his predecessor, but he's stuck now with implementing his predecessor's vision. But underneath that in the Department of Health, we've had three permanent secretaries. We've had um, uh, uh, the gentleman there, Sir David Nicholson, is currently the chief executive of the NHS commissioning board, NHS England, but before that he was chief executive of the NHS as a whole, and before that he was chief executive of the Strategic Health Authority overseeing Stafford. But in that role he was succeeded by this lady, Cynthia Bauer, um, who we'll, we may talk a bit about later, but she went on from that post uh, just before, just before, uh, is it where the balloon went up about Stafford, become chief executive of the Care Quality Commission, a role from which she uh, recently stepped down. But then the trust itself, um, in the time, there have been since 2006, I think, uh, four chief executives of that trust. And um, I think actually a fifth, come to think of it, and it's now an administration. But the, the average tenure in office of a chief executive of a hospital trust in England uh, is less than two years. Uh, and, you know, football managers do rather better than that. And uh, the, what happened, uh, you know, the public perception, and there's some truth in this, is that they all manage, generally speaking, to move on just before something goes wrong, so that the accountability is not there. And because of that, the staff don't really respect the chief executive. They know he's not going to be there very long. So it's quite difficult in that environment to affect change. And then the regulators. Well, we've not only changed the regulators twice, I think, in three times in, in, in the 10 years. Um, but uh, the current uh, regulator uh, has a ch change in personnel. It, it's onto its... Um, third chair since it was set up in 2009. It's on to its uh, second chief executive. And uh, then there's the monitor, the, reg the, the governance regulator, and now the competition regulator, uh, which has had two cha chairs stroke chief executive. The commissioners, well, as I said, they've changed frequently. <coughs> Directors of the trust, We'll talk about a bit later. And then inquiries. Well, no one listens to inquiries. Uh, Sir Ian Kennedy made a lot of recommendations after Bristol, which were remarkably similar to some I made, and only about half of them were implemented. So that's a, a part of the somewhat depressing background. Um, the, um, this is going to go down well in Australia, this line. Um, <laughs> The 20th of July 2009 was a very significant day for me because um, I was determined to go to Lords to watch us, me personally, the first time actually to see us beat the Australians in a cricket match. I go to Lords a lot and every time I've been we've been absolutely stuffed but on this day we actually finally uh, did it at Lords. And um, they, conveniently the match finished just before lunch and so I went to celebrate this victory in traditional style and I then somewhat unsteadily went back to my, off my chambers to find the phone glowing red with um, a request to phone the Department of Health uh, and where I was confronted with the request of would I undertake um, the chairmanship of an inquiry, which wasn't going to take very long, uh, in, <laughs> in, in a place called Stafford, had I heard of it? Uh, and the answer was not really. Uh, I asked if I could have an hour perhaps to think about this. And I was told, oh, no, I, could I have some time to think about it? And I said, yes, I could, an hour, because the minister wanted to make an announcement. I chatted with my clerk. He said, don't do it, it'll ruin your career. I was right, <laughs> right about that. But then I, I decided I'd do it anyway. So, so it was quite a busy, busy day, the 20th of July, for me. But mine wasn't the first inquiry even into Stafford Hospital. As I mentioned, there was the he Healthcare Commission report which, which brought the whole thing into the public view. Uh, there was then a, a, an independent case note review which was continuing at the time of my inquiry, which was actually for the first time looking at uh, individual cases as to what had gone wrong with those. There was a report on the emergency department, another one on the commissioning process, what had gone wrong there. But none of that satisfied the public. The public wanted, it, who'd been suf the suffering public, had wanted a review, a, a, an independent public inquiry. Well, the government wasn't going to give them that. But what they, it gave them was an inquiry 
to allow the patients to have a voice. And one of the interesting things was that um, the report that eventually came out uh, was said by many people to have an impact that other things hadn't had. And I think the reason for that was that it told the patient stories. It wasn't a report full of statistics and trends. What I heard uh, was shocking. And the reason, it, and, and I was sat in a room about um, half the size of this one. And over a period of six weeks, I listened in private to about three families a day, and I had them as families, come to tell me um, what it, that they had gone through in this hospital. And I'll describe one or two of this, a little bit of the stories later, but the impact on me of listening to that will never leave me. And it made me uh, look at things in a very different light to the way I, I, mean, I spent my career, as Ron unhelpfully mentioned, uh, rather a long one, dealing with uh, individual cases of suffering. But to hear time after time again the same sort of things being said by perfectly decent people anxious to tell the truth, bemused about why no one had listened to them before, uh, was profoundly moving. And I tried to convey some of that in the report, albeit remaining objective. And if you read no other part of the report, that, that, uh, and I don't blame you if you've only read executive summaries, do have, have a look at volume two of that first report, because it contains uh, summaries of the 900 people who came forward to give evidence to my inquiry. We didn't obviously see all of them. And of those, some 250, 260 gave positive stories. This wasn't an unremittingly gloomy picture. But we're talking about over a relatively short period of time, uh, the shock and horror of a lot of the remaining 600 cases. Now, this was a self-selecting group, you might say, but I will try to demonstrate in a few slides why even one of these stories could tell you that this was a hospital in deep trouble. So a report was published uh, with a mere 18 recommendations so that it would have remained there, but one of them was there should be a wider inquiry. And um, because it had turned out that uh, none of the bodies that were meant to have supervised, overseen, regulated this had the slightest idea, it, they said, that anything serious was going wrong. And the patients wanted, above all else, well, they wanted accountability. They wanted someone to be held to account for what had gone wrong. But they were also they wanted to know why on earth it was that this complex system with all these organisations had not actually spotted what they had managed to spot for themselves. So it was a big enterprise. We looked at over a million pages of documents. Uh, bureaucrats are very good at handing over documents to you in the hope that you don't spot the relevant email. 250 witnesses or more, um, 139 days of oral hearings. It cost our taxpayers £13.6 million. That's without taking into account the legal costs of the various bits of the NHS that were represented. But um, it may, whether it's value for money, depends on whether what I've recommended or uh, the impact of that is actually make, it results in change. Um, but then the Bloody Sunday inquiry, which was uh, about shootings in Northern Ireland, uh, 37 of them to recollect on one day, cost 192 million. So uh, the chairman, each inqui inquiry chairman's union of Britain is very grateful to Lord Savile because none of us are ever going to spend more than that on an inquiry. But it hasn't ended with my report. Uh, we've had the Keo review, which went to look at... Uh, 14 hospital trusts that had similar mortality rates at, uh, to, um, uh, to Stafford, and guess what? It found uh, that there were bad things happening in many of those hospitals as well. Uh, the famous Dr. Don, uh, Professor Don Berwick from uh, Boston, now a candidate to the governorship, was asked to review uh, patient safety and report, which he's done. A Sunday Times journalist by the name of Camilla Cavendish, but also a, a non-executive director of the Care Quality Commission, was asked to report into what education and training healthcare assistants needed. We await a review from a member of parliament and a senior nurse about complaints procedures. The House of Commons Select Committee has reported in a report charmingly entitled After Francis. I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the Royal College of Physicians, amongst others, has issued a response, part of which is well worth a read, uh, uh, the report on the, on, on, on the Future Hospital Commission, uh, uh, which looks at how hospitals in modern times with technology and so on ought perhaps to be designed. 
And then the, the people who matter, the, the, these are patients, or more usually actually the fam relatives of patients who died uh, at Stafford Hospital. And they formed a group uh, based in a cafe, which you see the wall there, called Cure the NHS. Uh, and just ordinary people who found themselves in extraordinary circumstances, having to take on a responsibility that a system had failed to do, uh, which was to demand that something be done about the care in their local hospital. And they had their stories and the questions uh, they wanted answered on the wall behind. Um, I, I went to see them a few times. The cafe became famous. I think every prime minister over several years visited it, secretaries of state, leaders of the opposition. It became a centre point of, of, of symbolism. Uh, and um, I went to see them once, and I was met with this group of people, very nice people, and they put a photograph of me down on the desk. And the other wall, by the way, has a sort of rose gallery of the people they think ought to be hung, drawn and courted as a result of all this. And they said, Robert, we're going to listen to you for 40 minutes, and when you go away, we're going to discuss whether your photograph's joining them on the wall. Uh, it didn't, which is rather nice. But they were led by this lady, Julie Bailey, there in the middle, um, whose mother uh, died in appallingly distressing circumstances after a multiple incidents of poor care. And all, what held all these people in common was that they all thought they were alone. They didn't think that their cases were part of a much wider picture. And it was when um, Julie Bailey wrote a letter to her local newspaper following uh, the trumpeting of some imagined success at this hospital that others realised that they weren't alone and they, they gathered together. And they won't give up. That was her, her clutching a copy of my first report on which she's written another government whitewash, which even at the time I thought was slightly unfair. But um, <laughs> she, uh, she, 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 I don't know whether she really meant it, because she, she left that copy of the report behind at the, at the press launch, and um, I now have it in my living room. Anyway, um, so let's go on to some of the stories. What, what was all this about? Well, the chair of the trust at the time was even after the first inquiry, um, really rather thought that there wasn't all that much to make a fuss about. She was asked at the second inquiry whether the numbers of people inquiring might be some reflection that poor care was happening to a lot of people, which seems a pretty logical question. And her answer was very striking, that it was more likely, much more likely, that a reason a huge number of people as other people didn't find anything uniquely dreadful is there's nothing uniquely dreadful to find out and that was still her belief um, after th this length of time a and um, well you could judge for yourself if you read the report whether that's a tenable position but uh, let me just share just a, a couple of the stories with you this was just a relative visiting her her mother a a and she saw this cleaner a very cl friendly cleaner because she was chatting with people a compassionate person but she went around the ward with her J-cloth, cleaning the ledges, cleaning the wards, saying hello to people. She goes into the toilet using the same J-cloth, comes out, starts wiping things again. So what she's doing is benignly spreading infection, possibly death, from one place to the other. Now, why was she doing that? Was, was she doing it because um, she didn't care? It seems unlikely. Did any, had she been trained? Did anyone tell her what an important contribution the cleaner made to the health of people in the hospital? I rather doubt it. Where was the supervision? Where was the nurse who said, don't do that, and to explain why? So even that one little story would tell you that something was amiss, one would have thought. But then it gets worse. And we hear many times in England the complaints from people, different hospitals, about buzzers not being answered. They want help and they don't get it. And it's in fact such a common complaint that I think it's easy to forget the suffering that lies behind that. Uh, th this is a description of what it was like in a ward full of elderly patients, some confused, some not so confused, but many wanting help to go to the toilet and not getting it. So they ring their buzzers and they carry on ringing it and no one comes and eventually they're forced to relieve themselves in their beds and then they sob and then it all goes quiet. And uh, what does that quietness mean? Well, to my mind, it means that these elderly people are just giving up. They really don't want to live anymore. And of course, there was a mortality rate here. And um, no one perhaps could possibly prove uh, that this sort of care directly leads to anyone's premature death. But what it, you can show is that it leads to a wholly unacceptable quality of life for anyone, let alone somebody in, in their last years or even days or, or weeks. 
And then we get this. This was the story of the daughter-in-law of a 96-year-old patient. He went to see uh, her mo uh, the mother-in-law, and um, she was naked in a room with the door open, so anyone walking past could see that. But that was only the beginning of it, because she was covered in feces in her hair, her eyes, her nails, and her hand. And it was dried, so it obviously been there for a very long time. And um, you wonder, how could it be in any hospital, however stressed staff might be, that uh, people, doctors, for instance, would walk by that door and not suggest rather sharply that something be done? How could it be that nurses could leave this poor lady in that state for uh, so long? And did anyone care? So this is just not just uh, uh, one person getting something wrong, a, 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 an idle nurse or um, a, just a one-off mistake. Something seriously, I would say, is suggested by that one case, or indeed in all those cases. But we had far more than that. Now it's often uh, said, well, it was suggested that the bodies, that many of whom I have just mentioned, had no idea of what was going on. And to some extent that was true. But an awful lot was known, if only anyone had put it together. And while it's easy to say, oh, well, you know that with hindsight, you undertake, took an investigation with a, that, that in mind, but I'm going to show you one or two things which were known at the time. In 2005, a nurse whistleblower uh, complained to senior management at the Trust about um, a particular ward, a ward where the elderly were being cared for. And um, quite properly, the Trust asked a senior nurse from a nearby trust, therefore in an independent person, to come and review this, this allegation. And she found uh, evidence of poor leadership, poor nursing care, poor staffing levels, and a, perhaps just as significantly a lack of commitment to the highest level in the trust to tackle these problems. And she submitted her report to the interim chief executive, who was the director of finance, in fact, who preceded the Mr. Yates, who I whose photograph I showed you. And um, he, the, the report was also seen by, by the chairman of the trust. What happened with that report? Nothing. Did it get seen by the board? No. Uh, was any action taken? None that we could find any evidence of. And why wasn't it seen by the board? Well, the explanation of the chairman, whose um, uh, quote, attitude towards what was known, I've shown you, was that this was a, an operational matter, not strategic, and therefore it wasn't a matter to trouble the board with. The, 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 the nurse who wrote this report never even got an acknowledgement. She never actually got told anything about this report. It got shelled, put in the drawer, and forgotten about. But um, there you've got someone from outside in 2005 saying there are systemic issues in this trust, which was, as information never got shared with anybody else. Again, in 2007, a patient, elderly patient, came in with a broken hip, and um, she was admitted. Uh, she was an insulin-dependent diabetic, and she was written up for insulin and admitted to the hospital. Her leg was dealt with properly. She, but she was in hospital for 11 days, during which time she was transferred through three wards. And at the end of the 11 days, she died because she hadn't been given insulin. And uh, there was an investigation by the in-house solicitor, uh, for a lawyer for the trust, and his report uh, disclosed all these failures in his opinion. And indeed, he said, uh, as his conclusion to the report, that in his view and the view of the staff he'd interviewed, uh, it, there was nothing to stop an incident like this happening again. Now, incidents of this nature are reported outside uh, the trust, and this one was through the computer system. Um, but um, by the time of my inquiry in 2010, Nothing had been done to follow up that case by the outside organisation. And um, this report never got to the board. This was clearly operational, not strategic. Uh, and it wasn't shared with a regulator. There was no transparency about that. Um, only last week, or well, maybe two weeks ago now, taking into account a dateline or two, um, there was finally a, there was a prosecution of the trust by our health and safety executive, and they pleaded guilty to systemic failings in relation to this case. But nothing was done in 2007. Then now to, on to someone who did try to do something. He was a trainee doctor, a senior, senior registrar level uh, doctor with ex serious experience of A&E and another trust. And he came to this hospital with a fresh pair of eyes. 
And he thought that the emergency department was an absolute disaster. That was his word. And um, he found a number of things that were wrong. He thought that it was dysfunctional. Uh, sorry, that's a different thought. He thought it was, there was bullying going on. Uh, he thought there was lacking, uh, lacking of leadership and all sorts of things. He was really worried. So he talked to his educational supervisor about it. He did nothing. He talked to the senior consultant in the department. There was actually only one active senior consultant. The one was, there was one vacancy, the other was dead, and it was uh, ill, rather. And uh, there was a, a, short, a general shortage, so the place was full of locums. But the man who was in charge did nothing. He went to his college, the College of Emergency Medicine, he went to a conference and he mentioned it to colleagues, senior colleagues at a breakout session, who were all very sympathetic, but no one thought this was bad enough to do anything about. So he eventually, he went to a, a, another training organisation, he started to do something, but by this time, in effect, it was too late, the Healthcare Commission were already there. But the one, one piece of learning is, which I do ask you to take away, if nothing else, is that trainees are extremely valuable as pairs of eyes. They, they come in with fresh eyes. They may not know all the medicine, but they do know about compassion and care. They know why they came into the service. And they can tell you, if you can get round their fear of telling you, uh, when things have gone wrong. Well, in 2007, the Royal College of Surgeons itself were invited into the hospital um, uh, because the hospital couldn't cope with a couple, a couple of surgeons who, funnily enough, didn't get on with each other. I'm sure that doesn't happen in New Zealand. And some distinguished people from the Royal College did this review and their report found that the department, not just these two people, was dysfunctional. It was lacking in effective leadership. There was no working relationship between the surgeons in, 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 in this team. And what that actually meant was it wasn't just people nagging, niggling with each other. They couldn't agree common procedures and wouldn't agree common procedures. So that actually the operating theatre staff had no idea from one day to the next what, op what instruments to put out for operations. It was as basic as, as that. And also, significantly, there was a at least one surgeon there with little or no insight into the problems that he had caused over a few years. And one of those was communicating with colleagues. Well, there was a cost to that, because nothing actually was done about that report. It was actually, in summary form, shared with the board. But the, the surgeons, the only thing that happened to the surgeons was they were sent on a behavioural management course. And the only thing they agreed with when they came to my inquiry was that that had been completely useless. But two years later, when the balloon had gone up, the Royal College was asked in, back in by the turnaround management. And this time, they found that some care was grossly negligent, the division was dangerous, and the alternative to immediate action was closure of the department. And the, the, this, the report refers to so many, too many, so many badly managed cases, it would be difficult to single out any particular surgeon. Well, the one surgeon I will single out was someone, the man with a lack of insight, who was advised at a multidisciplinary team meeting that the patient they were talking about uh, was unfit for surgery. That was a regional team. Under admittedly a bit of pressure from the family, he did operate on this unfortunate lady, and she was sufficiently unfit that she actually died on the operating table. And uh, th that's the sort of case the, the, they were discovering. So the cost of inaction was huge. Then there were the complaints. And complaints are a gold mine for any organisation which is ignored at their peril. And they're a goldmine for the, any regulator a, 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 as well. But the one thing that needs to happen with complaints is that when they are found to be true and, and justified, that something is done to correct whatever went wrong. And what we found here, and this is just a few examples, was that um, in relation, say, to falls, that systemic issues were found which, whereby a falls could be, have been prevented and weren't, a formulaic apology is sent to the family with an action plan to reassure them that things aren't going to be like this again. And pretty well the same action plan will turn up in the same ward um, you know, relatively soon, soon after that. Then let's go on to some of the... Um, uh, the to, to this. Um, about Talking about lack of transparency. A, a young man died in as a result of not having a ruptured spleen a diagnosed in accident emergency, but he, did die, he died two hours or so after being sent home. And that was the result, according to the senior consultant of the department, who was asked to write a report for the coroner of avoidable, uh, an inadequate investigation. And he wrote a report saying that. And the solicitor, the in-house lawyer for the trust, asked him to take that out of the report because of... I quote, to avoid further distress to the family 
an adverse publicity and actually put that in writing. Unfortunately and unhappily, the surgeon did remove that from the report, but even more unhappily, neither version of the report was ever sent to the coroner. But the culture of the trust was, it might have gone wrong, don't tell anyone. So they never told the family either. The family did find out by other means. But in the meantime, all throughout all this period, the HSMR mortality rate was just rising. Uh, as you probably know, 100 is average, below that's really good. Above, the more above that you get, the worse. And when we get to 124 uh, and 127, this place, this trust, is the fifth highest outlier in the country. And these figures were published in the, or the equivalent figures were published in the national press in April 2007, the same month as the instant independent lady uh, died. But the reaction of um, the Strategic Health Authority and this trust and others was firstly to say, well, the figures are down to our poor coding of cases. That's always the first excuse. Uh, but the second is that there are methodological flaws with this. So the Strategic Health Authority commissioned an academic study uh, from the University of Manchester, which, funnily enough, showed that there were methodological flaws. Now, Professor Jarman, who figures these are, agrees it's not perfect. But what he says, and everyone else now agrees, is that the very least you've got to do when figures like this can turn up is you've got to go and look at the cases. You've got to go and look and find out what is happening. Because underneath these, you can get diagnostic groups. You can find out where the high mortality is. And that didn't happen. So is this one off or is it common? Well, I think we can now say it's common. We, we, we've got Sir Bruce Keogh's review. The Care Quality Commission did a review on dignity and nutrition and they found horror stories around the country. In one hospital, a teaching hospital in London, a doctor was so desperate to get, make sure his patient was given water that he actually had to prescribe it. Uh, and um, <coughs> the Patients Association um, have, on a regular basis issue reports of patient stories from all over the country and the sorts of things I put to you are common. I think what was different about Mid Staffordshire was that they were prevalent throughout significant parts of the hospital. Now why did this happen? Well, this slide, you can alter this in all sorts of ways but in my view we have the pressures that I've mentioned which actually lead to various reactions on the part of staff at different levels there is, a, above all, a fear uh, in our system, and it's still there, I'm afraid. It's a fear that if you do the wrong thing or you say the wrong thing, you lose your job. That might well happen. Uh, there is the low morale that tends to go with that. There's a sense of isolation because the communication doesn't happen. There is the professional disengagement. I can't make a difference in all this. I'm just going to shrug up my shoulders and get on with it and the no openness. And, th and that comes out as behaviour, which is uncaring, unwelcoming, bullying, and people keeping their heads down. Uh, and I'm afraid habituation, the tolerance of the intolerable, denial of the undeniable, taking external reassurance. Instead of having governance systems actually tell the board what is really going on in the hospital, you look at an external inspection, it comes in and doesn't find something, and that reassures you that everything is all right. But above all, in a complex system of the one I've mentioned, and I think it happens more in complex systems than simple ones, it's always possible to say it's someone else's responsibility. So the doctors who walked past that poor lady's bed, faeces stained bed, were always able to say it's a nurse's responsibility, I don't have to do anything. Quite wrongly, but that's what they do. The primary care trust was always able to say that it was the health care commission's responsibility or the minister's responsibility. And the reality is these systems only work if everyone takes responsibility, even if it's also someone else's. So just a few examples from the evidence about, about these things. This was a nurse who said she felt ashamed because she went home and was upset because you can't say you've done anything to help. The buzzers go, you provided medical care, but it never seemed to be enough. And, and, and that's not a good attitude, not a, an attitude which is going to lead to this poor person being a, a significant contributor to change. The patients live in fear. They live in fear that if they make a complaint, uh, someone will retaliate. And even if that's not true, but unfortunately I think it probably was true at times at Mid Stafford, um, it will inhibit them from raising issues that are of real concern. So it's really important to find means of overcoming patients and their relatives' fear so that they tell you what's worrying them. Because if they do, you're likely to actually get uh, a really constructive relationship going. 
The fear is there amongst the doctors. This poor young doctor wasn't even working at Stafford. He came to my inquiry to support members of his family who'd had a bad time there. And even he was told by senior colleagues at his place of work uh, to be careful. Uh, and um, we're all conscious of our vulnerability, is, 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 is what he said. And that is just very, very true. And it's true even today, Dr. Mark Porter, the leader of the British Medical Association at a recent conference said that many doctors express fear about the consequences and this inhibits us from doing what we know to be right. And he goes on to talk about the duty of candour, which we can discuss later if, if you want. But I just found that quite shocking that the le a leader of the medical profession is prepared to say that fear inhibits a professional man from doing what he knows to be right. If you are a professional, whether you be a doctor, nurse, other, other, other professions. It is part of, should be in your DNA to carry on doing what you know to be right until it's corrected. And it's easy to do that in a well-run place, but where it's really necessary it, it, it are in places which are not being well run. But I'm afraid one of the reasons for that is the obvious one really of self-interest, but perhaps it's not often put as starkly as put by this senior consultant giving evidence on oath for his excuses for not doing anything at this hospital which was that he was less involved and he was approaching retirement. Uh, he didn't see himself as someone who needed to get involved, took the path of least resistance. But then the, the veiled threats he talks about. I shouldn't rock the boat at my stage in life because, for example, I needed discretionary points or to be put forward for clinical excellence awards. In other words, you know, his pension was going to be governed by his behaviour in his last few years. Uh, and um, you know, if he didn't get the points, he, his pension would suffer. So that is a real reason for not doing something about patient safety. And I'm afraid, shocking though that is, I suspect it's more prevalent than we would like to, uh, oh dear, I've turned it off, to admit. And so it leads to, this is evidence given by the chairman of the consultant staff committee, who was a physician, not a surgeon, but he, he, he said this was about the surgeon's concerns about a ward reconfiguration that put infected patients in beds next door to clean patients from different types of surgery. So, and um, there was a dissipation of the specialised nursing staff dealing with different conditions. But they gave up. They, they, they did raise the concern, but nothing happened. So instead of insisting, which they, I believe they could have done, uh, they just carried on doing their job. We'll have to make mend and do, which is the Stafford way, was what this gentleman said. But actually, it's the way, I think, of, uh, uh, of many. It, it's human nature. And part of it, when things get really bad, I'm afraid people have to ignore it. Uh, this uh, doctor, in fact, it's the same doctor you've mentioned before, put it this way, that if you're in that environment for long enough, what happens is you become immune to the sound of pain. You either become immune to the sound of pain or you walk away. You can't feel people's pain. You can't continue to do, want to do the best. When the system says no to you, you can't do the best you can. And I think it, some people, you can only cope sometimes by just ignoring the reality. And then there is the consequences for those who do speak up, uh, uh, which does deter others. This nurse um, reported to her superiors the fact, as she said, that the senior sisters in the emergency department, in order to sh show that it was complying with the access target, were actually requiring junior nurses to fabricate the discharge times of patients in their notes. And up with this, this lady would not put. But the result of that was that she was threatened physically, and, and she felt, got to the stage, it wasn't safe to go home at night without someone meeting her at the front door of the hospital. And ha she, not surprisingly, left the employment of this trust, uh, but more happily is working elsewhere where she's used as a patient champion. So that was a good, a happy ending for a whistleblower, but uh, that was shocking. But it also, also happens to those in the outside world, the patients who have suffered and their families. Julie Bailey, uh, had this said about her uh, on Facebook by an ambulance driver who's in fact been sacked as a result. I hope you suffer a life-threatening illness at night where, where you have to travel further than you should do because your local hospital is closed. Your fault. I mean, forgetting the grammar. I mean, what a appalling thing for an ambulance driver to say. But actually, astonishingly, it was an ambulance driver who, who his um, uh, mother died in appalling circumstances in this hospital and his father had come to give evidence about that at, at the inquiry. But um, so division is, is, is odd, but she, she's actually left town now. Her, she used to, her mother's grave was, the flowers on her mother's grave were continually being destroyed 
and every time it happens you get an email like this, thank you for closing Stafford Hospital, ha ha, you be better now spend time watching your mother's grave. So she couldn't take it anymore, she's, she's left town and um, her voice in effect has been still because other people have had, she can't really deal with this anymore. So the cost of actually putting right bad things can be absolutely terrible. So how do we change it? Well, I'm not going to go through 290 recommendations, many of which are context specific to the NHS, but I think some of the overall themes may be of assistance uh, to you. I mean, firstly, it seemed to me that we, in a complex system, and all healthcare is complex, that we need to make sure that we have very clear common values that everyone signs up to. It's not just a theoretical thing that sits in a policy document in a in a box somewhere. But everyone, whether it be consultants, the accounts office, cleaners, porters, contractors, all sign up to common values, all of which must of course start with putting the patient first. I believe we need a set of fundamental standards that uh, means that we don't forget the sorts of requirements that patients have that we all take for granted. We ought to be able to take it for granted that people aren't left in faeces stained sheets. We ought to be able to take it for granted that people are assisted to the toilet when they, they need it. But we actually, I'm afraid, need standards that actually focus people's minds on these really important things because they're often called, it's often called basic care, but there's actually nothing basic about the, um, the complexity of, of actually delivering these things. So we need focus on that. I think above all, and I've shown some examples of what, what happens if you don't have it, uh, we need a much greater openness and transparency and candour. I mean, but the profession of medicine has always been a bit of a, a, a secret. Professions are, lawyers are no better. We, know, skill, we like to keep our skills to ourselves, it increases our value. But we actually need to be more accountable about um, uh, how we're performing, whether we're effective in what we do, and to admit candidly when things are going wrong. Um, Leadership, if we had leadership, whether it be at chief executive level, ministerial level or, or at ward level, all needs to be absolutely f f centred on the patient. That's why we have a health service and it's so easy to forget in the complexities of the modern world with new things coming in, funding issues, finance and so on, to forget what it is it's all about. To, to do all this, we need accurate, useful and relevant information which actually tells us these things. Uh, and um, we need to remember, and this is more, I think, a comment for our country maybe than yours, but I don't know, which is that there's a, uh, the NHS is full of people waiting to be told what to do. And actually, if people took professional responsibility and articulated it, uh, then actually there wouldn't be all that much for a regulator to do. Now, the fundamentals of care, which the Care Quality Commission have put out for consultation, are those. Uh, and uh, they're, they're very much in line with what I suggested in my report. Uh, and, and what I have suggested should happen is that we should have a clear set of, uh, of standards of this nature, which everyone signs up to, so they are clear to patients, they are the things they want, they're, they're clear to professionals as things that can be delivered and should be delivered. And it should be clear that there are serious consequences for not getting these things right. So, um, if it persistently a, 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 an organisation is una a service is unable to deliver these apparently very simple things, then it shouldn't be delivering the service, and, it, and that should be a responsibility of the managers or leaders. If they recognise they can't do that, they shouldn't do it. If someone gets harmed seriously by a breach of some of these things, or perhaps some others. Uh, then I believe, and if it was avoidable, uh, then I believe there should be serious accountability. If we drive our car down the road, and I uh, don't know about here, <laughs> and you, you cross the red traffic light and you knock over a cyclist, no, you didn't intend to do that, you were probably preoccupied with something else, but you will be prosecuted for that as a, a form of accountability. And I believe where things are serious enough, we should have that in the health service. At the moment, Theoretically, offences can be committed by hospital trusts, um, but only after a notice has been served um, warning them that a, an offence has been committed, which is a rather circular thing, which means the Care Quality Commission has never to date prosecuted a hospital for a breach of any of its very complex standards. They have about 16 standards with uh, about 20 outcomes underneath each. The 350 pages of guidance as to compliance with those standards, another 450 pages of guidance as to how you assess compliance. And I want, of course, that, that all means absolutely nothing to the doctors and nurses and patients at the front line. And I believe what we need are a set of standards that 
you can actually tell whether they're being complied with. I can, you can, and the doctors and nurses can. And, and if they are, then encourage the staff to raise the issue. I can't do this because I haven't got enough staff, I haven't got the equipment, whatever it is. I think it puts the, the uh, responsibility where it should be. Um, just a few principles in my report, I won't take time on them because in many ways they're obvious about openness and transparency. But we do need to be honest with patients about what's gone wrong. But we, we mustn't allow organisational interests which always veer towards covering things up. It's always inconvenient to tell people the truth. It's changed. I noticed in uh, the paper yesterday in Britain, uh, the uh, director of uh, NHS, uh, the NHS in London went public to say that in his view, the emergency services provided in London were at times I inadequate. Now, no one's ever done that before. Uh, and um, it maybe had particular reasons for doing it, but that is a revolution in our country for a, someone in charge of a system to say we're not doing it properly. Frontline leadership. I've made a number of recommendations about f how we can g get better leadership, and a lot of this is about two things. One is actually recognising the value of frontline leadership and giving it space to lead. And the other is actually a clarity of responsibility. Um, unbelievably, we have boards above beds in most of our hospitals with a room on them for the name of the doctor, the patient's doctor. There's almost never any name down there. And um, of course, it's very convenient for the doctors. They, they, they don't get bo bothered by anyone asking them questions. But we d also find that doctors are going around without have find, being able to find a nurse to talk to about what they want done. And the nurse isn't there to tell the doctor what's actually happening in the ward. And there are a number of things of that nature which I believe um, are, are really absolutely important, some of which may well happen in good hospitals in any event. <coughs> Information. We, we, we live in a world where at a click of a button you can find out almost anything, but one thing that's very difficult to find out is how good your surgeon is or how good your oncology department is because they tend not to publish outcome figures. And their excuse is usually it's too difficult to do something that's fair. Well, I, my, I believe that the professionals who undertake this work have an individual or collective responsibility to devise methods which they say fairly measure what they do so they themselves understand whether they're getting better or worse so they can compare themselves with their colleagues, whether it be in the same hospital or elsewhere. And when they do that, it seems to me it's logical that we ought to be able to know. If I see a surgeon, I ought to be able to ask him what his outcome rate is for the operation he's about to perform on me, and he should tell me. And if he says, I don't know, frankly, I'm not going to have very much confidence in him. And once we've got that information, we need to disseminate it in ways that um, work. And we have some of this in England and elsewhere. The cardiothoracic surgeons after Bristol did start publishing figures. That's this graph on the on the left and by name you can look that up and um, believe it or not since they started doing that mortality in those in the procedures they publish has gone down by some 20 percent and it's not not emphatically not because they're not doing the risky cases they, they still are but, but it's the competition they may be well, well within the, the ordinary parameters but they see that x down the road is doing much better than them so they demand a system which allows them to do even better so it's a, it's a really constructive thing. The, the vascular surgeons have just uh, started doing the same. Uh, within two weeks, they're being asked to give consent to publication of their figures. All but about 40 in the country agreed to their figures being uh, published. And so, so, so they are. You can get there on the website. It did lead to this headline, which is a bit unfortunate. Uh, Daily Mail, uh, not a paper I'd recommend too often. The surgeons whose patients were up to 30 times likelier to die, and they published the pictures of three unfortunate people, which of course is complete rubbish. But I'm afraid that's a price that short term has to be paid because people construct league tables when league tables are, are, are not appropriate. But it's not a reason for not publishing the figures. The more that is put out there, the more people will understand the significance of it. And also it motivates the system, the professionals and so on, to actually uh, refine the figures so it is a more a reliable picture of what they do. But if it all sits there in the computer and never comes out, then we never use that gold mine of information and we, don't act, we actually forfeit uh, a really valuable opportunity uh, uh, for uh, gaining the public's confidence. And the longer we don't do this, the more likely we are to lose that trust. 
Uh, well, regulation, we can talk about that if you, if you wish, but I'm not sure how many of you are, are, are regulators here. Just, we're going to finish with a couple of thoughts. So one was, this, this was evidence given by Mr. Street, who was the partner of the insulin-dependent uh, lady, who had to give evidence called chat to me twice, uh, and, and made, at the course of that, of course, two written statements as well. But he, he said, I'm here for Jill and the rest of the dead. I'm not being sanctimonious. I could walk away at any time, but I'm not going to. When they took Jill away from me, they took away my contentment. I don't want anyone else to suffer that. Bereavement comes to us all but it's how it comes to you that is important. And so, needless to say, what they're looking for is, is to make sure that these things don't happen to other people. Well, I thought, I, we usually end there, but very recently I, my stepdaughter went to Nepal and she um, had some work experience, and usually went to a lep work in a leprosy hospital in Nepal. And outside the gate of that hospital is this notice, which may be difficult to read, People affected by leprosy are the most important visitors on our premises. They're not dependent on us, we're dependent on them. Service to them is purpose of our work. They're not outsiders to our service, they're part of it. We're not doing them favour by serving them, they're giving us an opportunity to do so. And I think if Mr Street were to see that, he would say that's exactly what he meant. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>